This morning as we begin to share, I really pray that you'll take notes and that you'll listen to this pastor's heart. I'm antsy. Sister Katie asked me what I was doing a while ago. I was pacing up and down the hall in the office in the dark. I have so much that I feel God wants me to share. And I want you to know that this morning you'll be able to take this message one or two ways. Number one, if you are just wanting to use God as a sugar daddy and fire insurance, and you're not really wanting Him to be your Lord and your Master and draw close to Him, you can take it as being a very harsh, a very, very mean message. If you're wanting God to be your Lord and your Savior, you're wanting Him to be your Master, you're wanting to draw close, as close as you can get and be ready when God returns, then you're going to take it as God sharing how much He loves you and how much He cares for you. That's going to be your choice and your decision. I am not intentionally going to try to step on any toes this morning, but people, if I do, please forgive me in advance. But I want you to know that it's not me that wants to bring this message. It's God's asking me to bring it. And I'm praying and trusting that I'll be able to bring it in a way that it will be touching your heart and your soul and your eyes will be open and you'll sit there and go, wow, I didn't realize. Because I've heard the statement as we have sung a song, I went to the enemy's camp and took back what he stole from me. Pastor Steve and I have heard the statement from people laughing and saying he hadn't stole anything from me. But you might be surprised when we share this morning how much he might have stole the love of Christ from you. How much he might have stolen your concern for your other brothers and sisters in Christ. And, and how much he might have stolen from you the guarding of your mouth. And to where the arrogance and the pride speaks more out of your mouth than the, the joy of the Lord Jesus Christ. So as we share this morning... Those on Wednesday nights that have been able to come and be in our teachings on Revelation will understand this a little bit better than those that have not been able to be here. But I want you to know, as I shared last week, I, start, I ended with making the statement, God has set a standard. I haven't set it. You're not going to set it. Humanity is not setting it. Our U.S. Supreme Court does not set the standard. Nor does our government set the standard. Our congressman does not set the standard. God has set a standard. And he expects us to live up to that standard. He has given us the Holy Spirit to lead us and to guide us, to encourage us, to strengthen us. And he has given us plenty of space and time under grace to repent. People listen to me. We do live under the Spirit of grace. Amen? But that grace has not been given to you to use the freedom of Christ to serve the occasion of the flesh and just continue doing that. He has been given to you to repent. Revelation chapter 2, writing to the church in Verses 21 and 22, he makes this statement. He says, I have given her time to repent, and she does not want to repent of her immorality. I will therefore then, or behold, I will throw her on a bed of sickness, and those who follow her teachings and the guidelines, or those who are immoral in their behavior and careless in their behavior, I will also throw on a bed of sickness, and those who commit adultery with her, I will put them into the great tribulation unless they repent of their deeds. God has given us the Holy Spirit to lead us and guide us. But here's what we overlook. God uses pastors, pastors' wives, Sunday school teachers, youth pastors, to be a channel that he will work through. If we ignore what they might try to tell us and instruct us, we might ignore what the Holy Spirit is trying to tell us. Come on. They're not trying to be your Holy Spirit. What they're trying to do is they're trying to tell you what they feel God is sharing for you to know. 
In Revelations chapter 1, we picture Jesus as our high priest. He is performing the priestly duties in the heavenly temple. One of those duties as the high priest that he is performing is he is cleaning and trimming the wicks of the lamp. He is refreshing the menorah or he is refreshing the candlesticks with new oil. And those candlesticks, whether they're individual or whether it is a heavenly menorah, which is pretty well a good possibility. Irrespective of what they are, they're representative of the seven churches, which is telling us that our Lord and Savior, Christ Jesus, in His atoning garment, is trying to clean and trim the wicks and refresh the church. And what happens is that just before the dawning of a new day, when he is standing at that menorah or those candlesticks, trimming and cleaning and getting ready to refresh and refill them with oil, Venus, the bright and morning star, is seen the brightest right then at the temple where, 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 beyond the menorah where they are, are cleaning. That is representing to them that a new dawning, a new day is about to begin at the temple. And what God is attempting to do is to give us signs and give us understandings to help us know there is a new day getting ready to start in the heavenly temple and our high priest is doing everything he can to clean and to trim the wick and to refresh his children, his church, his candlesticks with new oil. Amen? So that they can live up to the standard he has set. That standard is the Lord Jesus Christ, his word that became flesh and dwelt among us. Philippians says, let this mind, let this attitude, let this spirit that was in Christ Jesus be in you. Which means we are to empty ourselves of self and allow the Holy Spirit to lead us and guide us and to direct us and to teach us. Paul tells us in 1 Corinthians chapter 8, Knowledge puffs us up. And if you'll remember last week, we said, it don't matter how much knowledge you got stored up here in your brain. If you don't have love, it isn't going to do anything except be a sounding gong. And right there is where I think God is wanting to get us to realize that there are two commands that encompass the entire law. All of the prophets and all of the law is summed up into two commands. Love God with all of your heart, with all of your soul, and with all of your mind. Amen? The second is like unto it. Love your brother and sister, your neighbor, the one with a weaker conscience. Love them as much as you love yourself. You see, we can debate. Pastor Steve and I have talked. Others have talked. We can debate back and forth whether it's legal or not legal to do something, whether we have freedom or whether we don't have freedom to do something. That's not the point. The point is do you love your brother enough that if you realize that they might have a weaker conscience and a little less knowledge than you do, that you're willing to sacrifice and empty yourself with the same attitude and the same heart and the same mind as the Lord Jesus Christ did. There are scriptures that I want to go over that's not on your notes that we shared last week. Hebrews chapter 10, verse 26 and tw through 27 is one of them. You see, we are led and guided by the Holy Spirit in one way or the other. He is going to Help us understand and he is going to see, help us to see what may be displeasing to God. And it's not a question of can we or can't we, 
The question is, when we see that it might damage someone, then we begin to realize we have learned what the Holy Spirit wants us to learn. And if we then ignore it and continue to go on, it changes, and if we look at the words in a moment, it changes then from just unintentionally hitting the mark to deliberately, willfully transgressing and going beyond the boundaries that God wants us to go. Hebrews says this, after, we've, after we have received the knowledge, after it has been pointed out to us, if we continue on or if we continue willfully to, to do what could possibly be displeasing to God, after receiving that, there remains no more sacrifice. In other words, we've rejected the only sacrifice for that that there is, and that's the Lord Jesus Christ. And verse 27 says, but it's a terrifying expectation then of the judgment. What did he say up in Revelations? Do you remember? He said, I have given her space. I have given them time to repent. That's where the grace comes in, is that once we learn, we make the adjustments and the changes. But if we don't, then it begins to move us into a different capacity. And Hebrews chapter, 20, or chapter 10 and verse 29 says, How much severe punishment do you think he will deserve who has trampled under feet the Son of God and regarded as unclean the blood of the covenant which he was sanctified and has insulted the Spirit of grace? And this is what we closed with last week. Do you know how we insult the Spirit of grace? One of the major ways that we insult God's Spirit, that we trample the blood of Christ under our feet and insult the Spirit of grace, is when the Holy Spirit attempts to point something out to us or attempts to instruct us in certain areas of our life that could be corrected or that you and I need to really be stopping and taking a look at out of the two greatest commands of love. And we continue to ignore it. And we continue to justify our actions because of our knowledge. At that point, we begin to insult God's grace that has been brought to us to give us insight and wisdom. This is why it is so, so important for you and I to grasp and understand. As we look at the book of remembrance, there is a principle of separation and God wants us to know that sin will separate us. These are the six words in the Hebrew. I want to explain them to you for quickly again. The first one is A-V-O-N, and it is, means iniquity. And iniquity means to be bent or to be bowed. You've all seen something that's bowed and twisted and bent. It means to be twisted, to be perverted. It portrays someone that is living a life of perversion, being totally twisted out of the way of normality that God desires and longs. This is a deliberate and intentional action, a choice that they're making to do. The second one is P-E-S-H-A, and that one means transgression. This also is an intentional, deliberate action. It is a willful challenge to God. It means that you cross over or you pass over or you ignore the boundaries, the standard that God has set. You go beyond the standard, you go beyond the limit, you go beyond the boundaries intentionally as with an attitude to challenge God, to test Him. This is what is talked about in Hebrews when he said, do not harden your heart as they did in the wilderness, and they intentionally, and I'm going to put McConnell's unauthorized here, they intentionally challenged and provoked or tested God. They knew the boundaries, but they went beyond the boundaries. They intentionally challenged. The third one is actually three used together, A-V-E-L, R-A-S-H-A, or Z-A-D-O-N, and those are all used interchangeable, and that means basically it's the wicked actions, the evil actions, or the result of somebody that does not believe, and they're just living their life the way they want to live, and the actions are sinful, wicked, evil. The fourth one and the second one 
are the two most important for us. And people, I really pray you hear this pastor's heart. And I want you to know this has been very difficult for me to share what I'm sharing because I love you so much. I do not want to hurt, but yet at the same time, I do not want you to walk through life in a blindness and not realize what God is wanting to say because he is trying to clean his church up. He is trying to get his people back into the position so that he can refresh and refill them with a new anointing of the Holy Spirit and move them forth to a new day is getting ready to dawn in the heavenly temple. The fourth one is C-H-A-T-A, sin. It's the most frequently used in the New Testament, and the meaning is to miss the mark or to miss the standard, to be guilty of not meeting up to the standard. It's usually non-intentional. It's usually someone that's not yet aware. It's usually someone that's careless, foolish, not paying attention to detail or not doing proper behavior. Now let me use an example if I may. A young child that is just learning to walk. A young child that's just learning to talk has not yet been made aware of certain things. So they will do certain things unintentionally because they're not aware of it yet. But when you correct them, now listen to me, when you correct them, when you sit down and explain to them what they should not do and why they should not do it, and then they turn around and intentionally cross the boundaries that you have set, that you have shared, and that you've made them aware of, it changes from the unintentional missing the mark to the intentional pushing the boundaries. Do you get that? This is what God is trying to tell us in the book of Hebrews. If after you have received the knowledge. If after the Holy Spirit has attempted to correct or to guide you, to make you aware of something, and you justify and you continually go on doing it, then it changes from unintentional missing the mark to deliberately transgressing the boundaries that God has set. And that is where God is wanting us to know is that the point is sin. All sin will separate you from God. And God does not put it necessarily in order of this is the worst, bringing it on down. In fact, the very last sin that is to be dealt with in the book of Revelation back in chapter 20, 21 over there is lying. That's the last thing he deals with, is our, uh, our ability to lie. But when you begin to put down that God does not necessarily put it in an order the way that we do. We think if somebody does something, this, that's a whole lot worse than this down here. So we can't love them, but we can go ahead and love these guys and overlook what they're doing down here. That's not the way God works. What God wants you to know is that sin will separate and it still causes separation. When you look at the five foolish virgins, they were believers. When you look at the unfaithful servant, or Stuart and the unfaithful servant, and the faithful and the unfaithful, they were believers. When you look at the man at the wedding that was not dressed properly, he was a believer. He was there because he had been invited. He'd been called and he knew he was able to be there. God wants us to know that all sin will separate. And people, when you've been made aware, if you don't operate under the principle of loving God with all of your heart, soul, and mind, and then loving your neighbor, and Paul takes three chapters, chapter 8, chapter 9, and chapter 10 in 1 Corinthians to explain that principle. 
He dealt with that using himself as his own example. And this is a message all in its own that we will do at a later date. But there is a law of separation. And every time you see the message being spoken up in heaven and the angels flying around, the message is holy, holy, holy. Separate yourself, separate yourself, separate yourself. Holy, holy, holy. And when you see Isaiah in chapter 6, and he had a vision, he had a dream, he had a kazone of God, a revelation of God, the very first thing that Isaiah did was fell on his face and said, Oh God, I am a man of unclean lips. People, we go back to Malachi and we take a look at those that are in the book of remembrance and God is listening to you speak and the way you speak and the way you treat one another. God's watching that. He pays attention, and believe it or not, he can read our emails. He can read our texts. Amen? Please, Matthew chapter 24. I want to to share on separation a very, very important key. In Matthew chapter 24, verse 36 through 41. But of the day and the hour no one knows, not even the angels of heaven nor the Son, but the Father alone. For the coming of the Son of Man will be just like the days of Noah. For in those days before the flood, they were eating and drinking, marrying and given in marriage, right up until the day Noah entered the ark. They did not understand until the flood came and took them away. So will be the coming of the Son of Man. People, listen. There is a new day getting ready to start in the heavenly temple. If you looked at the uh, eastern sky on June the 30th, you will have seen the star of Bethlehem. It was the star of Venus, and it was Jupiter coming together to once again make the star of Bethlehem. And God is saying to his church, there is a new day beginning to dawn. He's trying to clean us up, people. He's trying to refill us and refresh us with his Holy Spirit. He's trying to cut away the things in our lives that may be displeasing to him. And he's doing his best to share it through his stars, his messengers, saying, please make this aware to the people. Make this aware. God has a principle. That principle is of separation. He has a standard that he has set, and he is going to separate those from, that meet his standard from those that don't meet his standards. We see in verse 40, it goes on and says, there will be two in the field. One will be taken. One will be left. Two women will be grinding at the mill. One will be taken. One will be left. Matthew chapter 24 and verse 42. Therefore be alert. You do not know the day that your Lord is coming. The King James uses the word watch, which means stay awake, be ready, be prepared, be dressed, watch constantly. I don't know if any of you have ever had someone say, hey, I'm going to come and get you. Let's go hunting. Let's go to the coast. Let's do something. I'll be over approximately around this time. Get up, get ready. You be ready. I'm just going to pull in the driveway and honk. Get ready. You get up, you get dressed, you get ready, you sit down to wait, and you fall asleep. Anybody ever had that happen? But when you hear the horn, what can you do? You jump up and you head out the door and you're ready. Why? Because you knew they were coming. You didn't know exactly when, but you got prepared. But if you get up and are tired and get your pants on and leave your shirt off and sit down to rest for a moment and fall asleep, 
Then when you hear the horn honk, you don't have time to jump up and get your shoes and socks and your shirt and grab your gear and head out the door because they're probably already gone. Do you catch the concept of what God is wanting us to do is to be prepared and to be ready to, to listen to what His Holy Spirit is leading and guiding and telling us in these last days. There are four parables, and we need to notice how many times, how many times Jesus warns us, how many different ways Jesus warns us, how many different illustrations Jesus gives to us. And quickly, I would like to mention four, and you well know that any time I say quickly, it doesn't mean anything, because to me it's not going to be quickly. <laughs> Number one is the ten virgins. They're all virgins. They're all believers. They're all waiting. They all know the bridegroom is coming. But five of them were not ready. They were foolish. And if you remember... The word foolish means dull or stupid. It doesn't mean ignorant. It doesn't mean unlearned. Listen to me, please. It means they were learned. They knew it. They understood it. But the reason they were foolish or stupid is that they knew it and they did it anyway. Do you catch that? It's because they knew that they shouldn't do or that they should do. They knew it. But they didn't do what they were supposed to or they were doing what they weren't supposed to. That's why he said they were morally heedless. They were morally careless in their behavior and in their attitude and in their spirit. They were allowing maybe the knowledge that they had to create a little arrogance and a little pride and felt that they knew enough that they didn't need to worry about their actions. The other five were classified wise. In other words, they were thoughtful. They had sound judgment. They were discreet. They were careful about their behavior and their spirit. They listened. They paid attention. They were compassionate. They were caring, emptying themselves of selves. And again, Jesus is urging us. He's giving advice. He's giving instructions. He's warning about the principle of separation. Five were prepared and went. Five were not prepared and didn't. The second one, the nobleman and his servant found in Luke chapter 19. The nobleman goes away to receive a kingdom and he left all that he owned with his servants. Now notice they're called servants. They belong to him. They're believers. He called them and he gave each one of them ten minas. That word means a certain pound or a certain amount of talent, ability, money, whatever. The first servant gained ten. He put it to work. The seventh, second servant gained five more, but the third hid it in the ground. In other words, it wasn't important enough to him to do anything about it just as long as he had it for himself. That's all he cared about. It was self that was on the controlling aspect of his life. Pick it up with me here in Luke 19, 20 through 27. Another one came saying, Master, here is your mind of which I kept put away in a handkerchief. For I was afraid, because you are an exacting man. You take up what you did not lay down, and you reap what you did not sow. The word afraid in the King James Version is fear. And it is P-H-O-B-E-O. -E it comes from another word which means to be totally terrified. Put to flight because of being so terrified, exceedingly alarmed, exceedingly scared of what's going to happen. Totally different from the word that is used in Malachi that said those that fear the Lord. That one is yar, which means to be afraid of what could happen, but knowing that it won't if you do what's right. And so you respect and honor and you draw close because of your reverence, your respect and your honor. 
But here it means to be terrified. It means kind of similar to what we find over in the book of Exodus to when Moses went up into the presence, but the people drew off at a distance because they feared God. They were terrified and they pulled away and started dancing around the golden calf. Verse 22 says, He said to him, By your own words, your own actions, your own confession, I will distinguish and condemn you, you worthless, wicked servant or you slave. And the word worthless or wicked here means somebody that is hurtful, somebody that is evil in effect or evil in their influence. Rather, it refers to the essential character, to the essential moral moral behavior, someone that is bad influence in the moral behavior, bad influence, bad example uh, of what they're doing and how they're setting their example. It indicates a degeneracy. It indicates something that is slipping from the original virtue that they once had. Someone that began to get just a little careless, a little foolish, and the influence and the bad behavior that they begin to exemplify begin to influence others as they slipped, as they begin to get uh, away from the original virtue. He says, did you know that I am an exacting man? Or rather, he said, you know what my standards were. He know, you know that you should have done something. You know what I expected out of you. And yet, at that time, even though you knew what I expected, you knew what I wanted you to do, you knew that I could bring judgment, you knew that I could separate, you knew what I had asked out of you, instead of actually doing what I've asked you to do, you withdrew from me and you continued in your bad behavior. Now that's McConnell's unauthorized translation. He said, why didn't you then, if you knew that, he said, why didn't you respect? Why didn't you honor? Why didn't you put my money in the bank? He said, why didn't you at least do something with it? Why didn't you at least keep it in your own life? Why didn't you at least keep your own life in the proper perspective, the way it had started that I had asked for, so that I could have at least collected interest and you would have been a good influence on people. And then he said to the bystanders, take the mina, in verse 24, take the mina away from him and give to the one who has the ten. At this point, he just lost his reward. Do you remember when we talked about receiving our rewards? At this point, this gentleman just lost his reward. It was taken away from him. His crown was given to somebody else. In verse 25, and they said, Master, this one already has ten. And he says, I tell you that everyone who has more will be given, but from the one who does not have even what he has shall be taken away. They will lose their rewards, and their rewards will be given to others that have been faithful and stood faithful and done what God has asked them to do. Verse 27, but these enemies of mine, and notice he is a servant, and yet what did God call him? because he wasn't doing what God had asked him to do, because he wasn't living up to the standard, God is calling him now an enemy. He did not want me to reign over him. He did not want me to be Lord of his life. He did not want me to be his master. So bring him here and slay him. Or the word slay means to, it's used in conjunction with the idea to take someone away, separate them. Here's the law of separation. Take them and separate them and get them ready for judgment. He's separating those people. Listen, please. God is going to separate those who made him Lord from those who did not make him Lord, from those who remain strong in a relationship, from those that got just a little bit away, just did a little bit of slipping, got just a little bit relaxed in their relationship, did not take the love of God or the love of one another in the seriousness that God asked it to be. Can I just take a rabbit trail for a moment? No, I'm not going to take the rabbit trail for a moment. We will, we will touch this later. Number three, faithful and unfaithful servant again, or steward, again, it's a believer. It's someone that he is called to be in charge of others. It has to do with helping others be dressed. It has 
to do with others being prepared and ready to go. It has to do with me. It has to do with Pastor Steve. It has to do with every Sunday school teacher. But how many of you know anybody that you're connected with, you're a steward because you are to be the one that's helping them get ready, get dressed, and be prepared. It has to do with a mom and a dad. It has to do with a spouse, a husband, or a wife. It has to do with every believer that needs to know that God has called you to help your family, your friends, your neighbors be ready, dressed, and prepared. I want you to look at Luke chapter 12, verse 35 and 36. Be dressed in readiness. Keep your lamp lit. People, we have to refresh our lamp on a daily basis. We have to allow the cleaning of our lamp, the cleaning and the cutting away of the wick on a daily basis. Jesus is trying to do that for us daily by His Holy Spirit to get into the presence of God and to wait in the presence of God and study the Word of God and see what God's Word has for us. Hear what the voice of the Spirit says. Listen to someone that tries to instruct and then line it out with the Word of God. Be like men who are waiting for the Master when He returns from the wedding feast so that they may immediately open the door when He comes, knocks, and then down further in the parable. Luke 1242, and the Lord said, Who is the faithful and sensible servant whom his fast master will put in charge of servants to give them their ration? King James says the portion of meat. And we've already dealt with this on a Wednesday and on another message. At the proper time, blessed is the slave who his master finds doing when he comes. Luke chapter 12 and verse 47, and that slave who knew you remember what he says in Hebrews? If after you have received the knowledge and you willfully continue on ignoring, I want you to look here. It says, And the slave who knew his master's will and did not get ready, did not act in accordance with his will. You remember what Revelation said? I will give them space to repent. People, we are under the spirit of grace. Grace is getting what you do not deserve. And that is God withholding His judgment. Mercy is not getting what you deserve. And that is you don't get God's judgment. We are under grace. He is giving us what we don't deserve. Space to repent. Do you hear that? His love for you is long-suffering. His love for you is everlasting. He is giving you space to repent. And he says that anyone who knows his master's will and does not get ready or act in accordance with his will will receive judgment. James chapter 4 and verse 17 to him who knows to do right and does not do it, it's sin. Can I just share with you that word of sin? And James starts out and it gives both the implication of unintentionally missing the mark. But once you learn that you've missed the mark and you don't correct it, it moves to transgression of crossing the boundaries. That's what James is trying to tell us. And the beating with stripes is an indication of not being spared from the coming judgment of the tribulation, but rather maybe having to enter in with the unbelievers. Please get a hold of what God is saying. He is talking to the believers. He's talking to the virgins. He's talking to the servants. He's talking to the stewards. He's talking to those whom the Holy Spirit has made the truth known. He's talking to those that are missing the mark, those that have been shown the truth, and yet they're ignoring it, and they're becoming foolish in their activities and in their moral behavior, and they're an evil influence or a wicked influence on others that are around them because of their activities that they are in. And then the fourth one, and I, I do need to move on. It's the, uh, the king's son found in Matthew 
chapter 22. It's the king's son's wedding. As we look at that, starting at verse 11, when the king came and looked over the dinner guest, he saw a man who was not dressed in wedding clothes. He said to him, friend, how did you get in here without the wedding garments? People, we've all been given wedding garments of the Lord Jesus Christ. We've all been given the garment of righteousness and we've all been given the instructions of the Holy Spirit how to put it on and we've all been given plenty of time to get it put on. He did not invite us to the wedding without providing and offering to us the garment. Please catch that. The man was speechless. The king said to the servant, bind him hand and foot, throw him into outer darkness. Where is outer darkness? It is the tribulation that God is wanting us to catch. And in verse 14, many are called, many are divinely selected, many are invited to participate, many have been given the garment, but only a few are chosen. Because broad is the path that leads to destruction, but narrow is the gate that leads to eternal life. Few are chosen, and the word chosen means selected, separated, and put into his stock as being precious jewels. Hear what he's saying. He is gathering his jewels. He is selecting by implication. He has given you and I the wedding garment, the garment of righteousness, calling us to his son's wedding. There is a principle of separation, and Jesus our high priest in his atoning robes in the heavenly temple is attempting to clean. He's attempting to trim his lamps, you and me. He is attempting to refresh us with the oil of his Holy Spirit because a new day is about to start. A new dawning is about to happen in the heavenly temple. And all of what he's been sharing is to understand they are believers. They are waiting. They know he's coming. They've been invited. They attended the wedding, but they did not act adequately and properly. They did not allow their lamps to be kept refreshed and to be refilled. They did not allow their wicks to be trimmed and to be cleaned. And yet as an individual invited to the wedding and the unprofitable servant not sharing with others, not witnessing, not testifying, not being an example for the neighbors, for the family, for the friends, for the spouses, all believers will be separated. Those that are unfaithful from the faithful. Those that are unprofitable from the profitable. Those that are dressed to those that are not dressed. Those that are foolish from those that are wise. They will be separated and cast into outer darkness. And remember, Zephaniah tells us and gives us a picture of what outer darkness that they're being cast into is. Zephaniah chapter 1, verse 14 and 15 Near is the great day of the Lord. Near and coming very quickly. Listen, the day of the Lord. In it the warrior cries out bitterly. It is a day of wrath, a day of trouble, a day of distress, a day of destruction, a day of desolation, a day of darkness, a day of gloom, a day of clouds, and a day of thick darkness. He's casting them into outer darkness. Zephaniah tells us what it is. It's the tribulation. And what does it say that will happen in the tribulation? There will be weeping and wailing and gnashing or grinding of teeth because of the pain, because of the hopelessness, because of the sorrow, knowing what they could have accomplished and done and what they didn't do. Go back up and look at verse 14 where it says, In this day the warrior cries out bitterly, There's the weeping. There is the groaning and the wailing and the grinding of teeth. Please, the the future punishment and judgment of those that are lackadaisical and that are unprepared and not ready, that are foolish or not putting on the garment that's not doing what God has called and asked them to do. This expresses the fact that those that have been called who will be shut out from the light of heaven. 
There will be those that have been called that will be shut out from the peace, the joy, and the hope as the result of missing it. And they will then in turn be weeping in hopeless grief and in hopeless pain to some degree, grinding their teeth from the sorrow and the agony and the pain. Ten virgins waiting for the bridegroom. They all believed and they knew he were coming. Five wise, five entered. Five foolish, five didn't. Three servants with money to invest in God's kingdom, to give of their tithe and to give of their offerings, to continue to invest in God's kingdom. Two were wise and invested. One didn't and was judged. Many received wedding invitations. Many were given the proper garments to put on and were allowed to stay, but one man didn't take it serious that was invited as well, was foolish and didn't put on the proper garment and was cast outside. One servant, one steward was disobedient to the master's instruction, was removed and put into the uh, place of the hypocrites and beaten with many stripes, received judgment because he knew what he should have done and how he should have changed, but he didn't take it serious. He was foolish and he did not change. He did not take the space that was given to him to repent. People, listen, I'm not trying to be mean. I'm not trying to be harsh. I'm not trying to be condemning. I'm not trying to be judgmental. What I am trying to do is to share with you what God has been dealing in my heart and my spirit for the last six months, and it is just literally causing me to climb the wall and not knowing whether I can relate it to you in a way that I feel God wants you to know. And we are being careless in our activities. We are being careless in our lifestyle. We are being careless in our conversations. We are being careless in the places we go and the things that we do. And we are not caring about anybody else but ourselves. And God is saying, I've given them a space to repent. I have given them grace. I have given them my Holy Spirit to lead them and guide them. And once they know the truth and they continually, willfully walk the path that they're continually walking, there remains no more sacrifice. They are insulting my spirit of grace. They are trampling the blood of my son Jesus under their feet. And friends, I am separating and calling my jewels because there's a new day dawning at the temple. Quickly, Matthew chapter 24 and verse 42, 44. Therefore be on the alert because you do not know the day the Lord is coming. And again, here's another principle for those of you that are leaders of your house. Be sure of this, that if the head of the house and the King James uses the good man which means that he was the head of the family. He had family, kids, a wife, a spouse. He said if the leader or the goodman of the house would have known at what time the thief was coming, he would not have allowed his house to be broken into. He would have stayed on the alert, and he would have been watching. He would have been ready. He would have had his household ready. You know what it's saying? The word broken up. When you get into the New Testament Greek and you begin to look at the derivatives and you begin to look at what he's saying, he would have not allowed the thief to penetrate and burglarize or take from his house. You know what it's referencing? Hear me. He is referencing here that the head of the house had people missing. They were taken. He was left. For this reason you must be ready, for the Son of Man is coming in an hour when you do not think that he will come. Proverbs chapter 29, and this is where I close. I promise I will close. Proverbs chapter 29 and verse 18 is a very powerful scripture for you and I. Where there is no vision, the people are unrestrained. But happy is he who keeps the law. Now for you and I, the law and the prophets is summed up in love the Lord your God with all of your heart, with all of your soul, with all of your mind, love your neighbor as yourself. 
loving our neighbor as ourself becomes a very important key, a very important issue. The word vision in the Old Testament, 2377, Kazon, means sight. It means mentally being given a dream. In other words, a revelation, an oracle from God. So he says, where there is no revelation, where there is no dream or insight, spiritual revelation from God, now catch this, the people will become unrestrained. And that word unrestrained in the King James says perish. And it is the Old Testament 6544, and it means they will dismiss the laws of God. They will uncover the laws of God. They will throw off the laws of God. In other words, they'll throw off the restraints and they will become careless in their behavior. Do you catch what he's saying? People listen to what he's saying. When there is no true, intimate relationship with God, when you don't have the proper fear, respect, reverence, and honor for God and His Word, when you do not believe God, and this is where we're going next week, and just let me tell you, if you don't want to hear the difference between believing in God and believing God, then don't come next week. There's a big difference. Because even the demons believe in God. But friends, when you and I disobey and don't love the way God asks us to love, that's because we don't believe God. Do you know you can believe in God and not believe God? Amen? Anyway, that's next week. When we have no revelation, no intimate, deep oracle from God, we will become careless. We will become foolish. We will throw off the restraints and because of our knowledge. Paul said knowledge will puff you up. And because we get knowledgeable, we get understanding of the liberty we have in Christ. And because of that puffed up, liberty that we have, we become arrogant and prideful and we begin to throw off the restraints and think we can do whatever we want to do no matter who it hurts. And that's not true. God is wanting us to catch and to see what He's wanting us to say. People, God has set a standard. He's given us instructions. He's given us those instructions through the Holy Spirit to teach us, to lead us, and to guide us through all truth. He's given us grace by the Holy Spirit to give us time to change. He's attempting to teach us. He's attempting because a new day is getting ready to start at the temple. He is attempting to, to refresh us, to refill us, to get us back where we need and long to live. We are living in the day of His grace, but His grace has not been given to us to continue using the liberty as an occasion to serve the flesh, but rather to allow his spirit to clean us, to trim us, and to refill us and refresh us with a new anointing of the Holy Spirit. Amen? I'd like to ask the worship team to come back if they would for just a moment. I'd like to ask the musicians to come back, the, the, those that play instruments. They're not, they're not magicians, they're musicians. To come back, please, if you would. People, God is a God of compassion. God is a God that will long suffering. His love is everlasting, is far reaching. He will go to the ultimate extends to love you. All he's asking you to do is listen to his heart, listen to his spirit. I don't know if you're paying attention or not to the news. I've been telling you, and I'm not a prophet. Pastor Steve and I have been telling you for, for a long, long time, get ready. Something's happening. Amen? I have heard that on the, I don't take it, so I don't know. I've heard on the register guard, they have talking about the earthquake supplies. Make sure you get them. Also read that there's not too many free, uh, freeze-dried foods available anymore because the government's been stockpiling them because they know something's getting ready to happen. 
I also read, and I cannot verify this, I will just tell you, I read that a lot of the uh, congressmen and a lot of your financial leaders are taking their money and pulling it out of the United States and putting it in offshore accounts to protect themselves because they know a financial crisis is coming. You know what we need to do? Dig deep and get our feet on the solid foundation of the rock of the Lord Jesus Christ and let Him refill us with the Holy Spirit. Let Him cleanse us, purge us, trim our wick, and get ready for the new day that's getting ready to dawn. Amen? That's what God is longing for us to do. Would you stand with us this morning?